Hola, Cage Fighting Connoisseurs. This is KidNativeBloodyElbow.com. I'm battling more technical gremlins than even usual. My sour mood. Got to say once again to the Google overlords, I hate you people. Uh, you, I'm definitely not your customer. I'm just your product. Anyway, I'm here to look back at UFC 175. I'm not wearing the bathrobe, but I've got the bathrobe with me. It's too late and too hot uh, in Texas. It's past noon. It's 1 p.m. To be toddling around in my bathroom, I got kids. I was up at the crack of dawn taking care of that. Even after staying up till virtually the crack of dawn, uh, following up UFC coverage, trying to uh, bring all the goodness on bloody elbow, dealing with side outages, blah, blah, blah. Poor me, cry me a river, the hard, hard life of a cage fighting blogger. It is what it is. Let's look back at UFC 175. Obviously, Zane Simon and I looked back at the fights, talked about Weidman and Machida, whether or not it was a fight of the year candidate. Uh, fight where it ranked in terms of all-time fights, recent fights. I think our consensus was was a we came to conclude that it was comparable to the Jones Gustafson fight, not quite there, but close. Very good fight, um, made up for a pretty crappy card. That and Ronda Rousey's big star performance it delivered what it had to do for a pay-per-view. The problem is the UFC brand used to be stacked pay-per-view cards. And it was a four-fight pay-per-view instead of a five-fight pay-per-view because Stefan Struve had a panic attack and had to be taken off the card. This is a kid who just spent a year out with a major heart condition that they thought he might never fight again. So they erred on the side of caution. Good call. I'm glad they did. In fact, maybe they shouldn't have even signed him to fight. Um, and uh, maybe they shouldn't sign him to fight again. I don't know. Nevertheless, the deal is the UFC has spread the butter on the bread so thin. It's like... Bilbo Baggins after carrying the ring for 50 years saying he just feels a little transparent. You can see through their act, okay? Last night's post-fight media scrum with Dana White and the press conference was amazing. He was shouting and screaming that he doesn't worry. He wasn't shouting and screaming. But he was saying, you know, I don't worry about buy rates. I don't care how many people watch the program. If you don't like it, don't watch it. And I'm just thinking, this is a guy that's trying to to nail big deals with sponsors and deals with TV partners all over the world. And his attitude is, if you don't like it, don't watch it. I mean, can you imagine if the CEO of Taco Bell's response to, to, to getting some blast back about their waffle taco breakfast was, I don't care if you don't like our disgusting crap breakfast. And hey, I like this stuff. I think it's kind of gross or whatever, but I think it's a perfectly good product from Taco Bell insofar as being Taco Bell. Taco Bell doesn't do that. They say, we love it. We hope you like it. If you don't like it, try our regular burritos. You know, I mean, there's just this lack of customer service or this some sort of defensiveness that's so strange on Dana White's part. He wouldn't field any questions about UFC 176 as he said he would deal with that Monday. That's the card that's set for August 2nd that's quite likely to be canceled because they just lost the headliner with featherweight uh, uh, Jose, uh, Bra Jose Aldo. Sorry. Jose Brow, and, and uh, you know, and now we've got we've got another card tonight with the Ultimate Fighter finale, which I literally forgot all the way through the six round episode last night. It just like n nobody nobody cares uh, about this stuff. I don't even remember it's happening the next day. The only reason it's happening in Vegas, presumably, is to get one more ticket buy out of the Expo fans who already flew to Vegas and they're squeezing for every buck possible. And it's just. Just not pretty what we're seeing. You have a guy like Robert Drysdale that has a lot of fan interest that's fighting on the fight pass card of this thing tonight. Like, why wasn't he, you know, it would have been nice to see him on the Fox Sports 1 card or maybe the pay-per-view card. I mean, just, you know, let me run through the fights and, and just, you know, tell you what, they, what was what. Kevin Casey, Bubba, Bubba Bush, 61 seconds of mayhem if... if it's on Fight Pass. Go back and see it. I highly recommend it. Kevin Casey might be somebody who makes an impact in the middleweight division. I don't know. Luke Zakrick versus Gilham Vasconcelos. Watch that anytime if you're really interested. Maybe next time before Zakrick fights or Vasconcelos fights, uh, check it out. Not a terrible fight. Not a good fight. Not, if you're looking for entertainment, don't watch that fight. Skip that fight. I would give it uh, two stars. The Casey fight, I'd give three stars. There was no drama, but... Saw some action. Bantamweight uh, in the Fox Sports 1 opening fight. Bantamweight Rob Font versus George Roop. I'd give it three and a half stars. Solid knockout. Nothing surprising. I'd watch it now. It's only three, two minutes and 19 seconds of, of violence, so why not? You know, Font, somebody who's announced his arrival in the Bantamweight division with some mayhem, so it might be fun to see again. Middleweights Bruno Santos and Chris Camozzi, zero stars. Do not watch this fight. I rocked the baby while my wife watched the fight and told me what was happening and followed the action on Twitter. I'm not going to go back and watch it. It was a lay and pray exhibition from Bruno Santos. Chris Camosi won the first round and then apparently elected to use his knees 
uh, and flying knees and put himself in the position to be to be laid and preyed on, and just stupid. Bad game planning, bad fight IQ from Camozzi, who's one of my least favorite fighters, and Bruno Santos rocketing to the top of the ranks of my least favorite fighters. They're cutting guys like John Fitch and Yushin Okami for being boring and signing Bruno Santos. Why? Because cheap. Because boring fighters, that it, it's like giving the choice between two boring fighters. I'll take the cheap one instead of the expensive one. Dude, you're supposed to be the world's premier MMA brand. Like, you know, you should be real picky about which lay and pray fighters you sign and, and push on us. Uh, Welterweight's Kenny Robinson, Eldemar Alcantara. I kind of like this fight. Uh, Robertson took a unanimous decision. Oh, Bruno Santos took a unanimous decision. Or a split decision, I mean. Robertson uh, took a unanimous decision. A lot of nut shots, but completely dominating performance. Hats off to him. He, he looked good. Uh, uh, did what he had to do. I'd give it three and a half stars just because it was a gritty performance. Robertson didn't have the athleticism or the skill set to just come out and dominate, so he had to use cleverness and strategy and some nut shots uh, to beat Alcantara. So that's fun to watch. I'd watch it. I wouldn't watch it now. It's not like, let's not get carried away. But I would watch it at some point, maybe before Robertson fights again. As far as Alcantara, he's definitely the lesser of the Alcantara brothers, and I'm not too worried about uh, watching him next time. I don't think he's going to be making an impact in the welterweight division if he can't get past Kenny Robertson. That brings us to Bantamweight main event. Go ahead and watch this now. I'd give it three and a half stars, Uriah Faber, and a, a vintage Uriah Faber performance. And Alex Caceres, a.k.a. Bruce Leroy, Looked pretty good uh, in this one. I, I was um, uh, totes impressed. Uh, you know, it was a, what I expected. Your eye favor because of his style, because he's 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 looking for that quick submission win, but it's not always easy to set up that quick submission win. It's always always quick. So that lets somebody like Bruce Leroy get in the fight maybe a little bit more than he actually was. It looked like he was in the fight a little bit more than he actually was. This plug is bothering me, so I'm going to move it here. Go full Luke Thomas. Um, Anyway, uh, you know, so so a decent fight. Uh, you know, go ahead and watch it if you catch it on Fox Sports One's uh, re reruns. I'd give it three and a half stars. Nice to see the California kids still out there. A bummer to not see him on the pay per view though. He could have used them for fifty five bucks. That would have been a nice addition to the pay per view card. Now let's come to the fifty five dollar or forty five dollar if you got it in standard def. But who wants to watch fights in standard def anyway? It's twenty fourteen. The, the cost is fifty five ninety five. Let's face it. I mean, nobody who, if you've got friends, somebody has a high def TV, and you gather around, and and that guy pays, and everybody chips in. If if you don't have a if you don't have a high def TV, what are you paying for pay per view anyway? Go to Buffalo Wild Wings or whatever and watch it there. Like so, um, I mean, sure, some people watch it in standard def, whatever. Um, anyway, Russell Down versus Marcus Brimage, bantamweight split decision fight. The, I, I think you could watch parts of this and get the, the idea that, that both of these guys uh, are decent fighters with their bantamweights. Nothing thrilling about this fight. A decent back and forth, but it, it, it ultimately amounted up to nothing. I'd give it two stars, uh, and I'd, I'd skip it. I would never watch it. Uh, middleweight Uri Hall versus Thiago Santos. Kind of a painful one to watch because Hall broke his toe. And he's just a d maddeningly frustrating fighter. I mean, Dana White and some people were saying after the fight, well, the fact that he fought through the adversity with his toe broken and kept coming proves he's a fighter. Well, certainly he's a fighter, but it doesn't prove he's a fighter with killer instinct, which is what we want to see. He totally had Thiago Santos's number. You could clearly see he could juke him, and c if he had been able to pull the trigger, he could have finished the fight, I think. I'm just not convinced that, that Uri Hall didn't have a spectacular finish. Uri Hall, I just don't think, is ever going to be live up to his potential. He could be the king of the gym, but not going to be a, a, a star in the UFC. I just don't see it happening, and that's too bad. But it is what it is. Now, speaking of stars, we had Ronda Rousey steamroll Alexis Davis. Hip toss, scarf position, headlock, punches, 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 and it's out. Broke a cyst on her knuckle. Had to get nine stitches. Has a minor knee surgery coming up. And then Joe Rogan asks her, are you going to step up and fight at U70, UFC 176 at August 2nd? Now, I initially thought this was like a setup, and Dana White and the Fertitas were in on this, and this is what they wanted to do. And I thought that was just insanely stupid. I was very relieved to see Dana White furious immediately uh, off camera that this this was not what he wanted to do. He was furious that the producers after uh, and the press conference made it very clear that, that the UFC is in the Ronda Rousey business and they do not want to be burning her. I mean, who would she fight in a month anyway? I mean, 
maybe Kat Zingano's back, but nobody's dying to see Kat Zingano fight Ronda Rousey. They just saw Ronda Rousey steamroll somebody. They don't want to pay 55 bucks again in a few weeks to see that. And then you've got Jacare and Musasi, which, which is a great fight I want to see and is pay-per-view worthy, but most casual fans don't even know who those guys are anymore. And you're just, you know, the sad thing about last night was web traffic was good. Uh, despite we had some outages on the tech end, so SBN support, please pay attention to us in the future when we tell you there's a problem because there was and you ignored it and it came back to bite us in the ass. But I couldn't accurately gauge our web traffic. It was strong, not overwhelming. I mean, last time Chris Weidman fought, we set our all-time traffic record. Of course, that was Anderson Silva breaking his, his leg in a freak fashion, but this wasn't like that. However, the tweet reports I got from around the country or that the bars were empty. People were not, I mean, you know, people were not packing the bars to see Buffalo, to see this fight at Buffalo Wild Wings and the various other places, Hooters or wherever, bars that pay to see it. And with the high price bars have to pay to host UFC events, that just means fewer and fewer of these bars are going to be hosting UFC events. So, I mean, that's the thing, you know, they, they're burning their audience and they're burning their partners and, uh, uh, we're at the point of diminishing returns. I mean, this fight event was supposed to be the biggest event of the half year. It's definitely the biggest event of the year so far, and it's pretty much the biggest event in the horizon. We've got J Jones Gustafson too coming up towards the end of the year. We'll have Cain Velasquez and Fabricio Verdum in Mexico. We'll eventually have Anthony Pettis versus Gilbert Lundas for the lightweight title. But none of those are GSP fighting. None of those are Anderson Silva returning. I mean, uh, they're just not that big a fight. None of those are Ronda Rousey versus Chris Cyborg, for example, or Ronda Rousey versus Gina Carano. I mean, this was it. This was as good as it's going to get for the foreseeable future, and it wasn't that good. And so I'll be very curious to see. They seem hell-bent on their pedal to the metal. More, more, more UFC, more UFC, more UFC strategy. And, you know, MMA Logic's been on the boards talking about how the problem isn't oversaturation, the problem is a, is a weak cable partner. Well, Fox Sports 1 is definitely a weak cable partner, not nearly the synergy they had with Spike TV. Um, but the reality is it's oversaturation plus a weak cable partner. If you have a weak cable partner, that is not the time to put pedal to the metal on maximum programming. Now, I think their revenue is probably up. These guys watch the bottom line very closely. I just don't trust their long-term uh, ability to build a promotion and, and build a sport. And I, I just worry the sport is in a very precarious situation, um, at, at least as far as short-term popularity, and things are going to need to change. they got to change the way they're doing things and, put, and book better fights uh, for people. And, and just pull your head out of your ass, Lorenzo and Dana. I mean, it's not my place to say it, whatever. You guys are the big business geniuses. You guys are the guys who built the sport in this country. But, dude... You're dragging the whole thing down with, with too much. Just too much and not good enough. This was not, for the card of the year, this was crap. I mean, you had one great fight in Wyman versus Machida, but a fight that only connoisseurs dug. Like casual fans who don't understand the footwork and the chess game and the way that Wyman was able to control the cage and don't under, already know how dangerous Machida is, didn't they just saw it boring dancing around for most of the first two and a half rounds before Weidman got control of the fight and then and then they did I mean I think anybody could appreciate Machida's uh, reckless rushes uh, to to get the finish in the fourth and fifth round when Weidman began to gas a little but nonetheless it, this was not a fight this wasn't Griffin Bonner this wasn't a fight that anybody could watch and be blown away this was a fight you had to have a certain appreciation of the sport to be blown away by. Rousey, anybody could get. Rousey did a star turn. I watched this event with my wife, one of my old best old friends, and his wife, who has never watched the sport. Everybody was fascinated with Ronda Rousey, all the ladies especially. And, you know, she's a star, but like Zane Simon pointed out last night, I think that she, um, people are checking Ronda Rousey out, but they're not necessarily following Ronda Rousey from fight to fight, and it's not building on itself. She's, she's drawing in pools of random people that are interested in checking her out, but I'm not seeing it building. You know, and it's not being built in a coherent way because she's always on pay-per-view. Now, if Ronda Rousey was on Fox every time and they were seeing this narrative of fight after fight from Ronda Rousey on Fox, that would be built into something big. If they had the luxury of putting Ronda Rousey on Fox until they signed the Chris Cyborg fight or the Holly Holm fight, then they could be talking about something really big. Well, they haven't done it. They aren't doing that. And 
you know, I don't even know if they'll sign Chris Cyborg. I don't know if they'll sign Holly Holm. I don't know if Ronda Rousey isn't going to run off and make movies. If Ronda Rousey has a hit movie her first time out the gate, that might be it for her cage fighting career and, and, and more power to her. But the UFC will, would have <laughs> dramatically misplayed their hand with Ronda Rousey in that instance and then used her just in a short buck terminology and, and thinking and not ever gotten a really, really big fight out of her because – Women's MMA has a potential to have a cultural impact beyond what men's MMA did. We talked about this last night. Some of the people in the comments corrected me. Yes, women punching each other in the face was a staple of roller derby in the 60s, but that was fake. Uh, but it, it, it was real. Uh, uh, we've had women's professional wrestling uh, as part of the culture for a long time, but in a really minor way. And again, that's that's fake and worked. And so, um, you know, women's boxing had a brief flurry of interest when Muhammad Ali's daughter was fighting around the turn of the millennium and you know we're in a world where women are participating in combat on the regular uh, both in US armed forces Israel armed forces you know Russian armed forces all around the world and the roles of women are changing the physicality of women are changing and this is an interesting dynamic that catches a lot of people's attention. A lot of young women are trying to figure out their place in the world that's changing rapidly, a world in which it's no longer taboo for women to engage in violence, and uh, they want to learn how to do that well, I guess, and, 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 and what's it mean to be a female fighter, et cetera, et cetera. It's got this cultural frisson that men fighting hasn't had for a long time, and I don't know if they'll have again. So the UFC has this opportunity to put something really special together, a fight that people are going to talk about and remember for a long time. Now, obviously, you got to set up the right fight. you got to promote it right. you got to have the fight go well and tell the story people want to see. But uh, So a lot of variables there. I don't think they're going to do it, though. I think they've got the chance to do it, but I think it's just going to be like Fedor's various uh, near misses with a major – uh, American pay-per-view fight that just didn't come together. If Fedor and Brock Lesnar had fought in the UFC in 2009-2010 in Dallas Stadium, that would have been an epic. If Fedor and Fabricio Verdum or Fedor and Al Alistair Overeem had fought on CBS, if Fedor had lost on CBS for Strike Force, that would have been epic, and that would have set up a big pay-per-view rematch. But alas, alack, uh, Strike Force had already shut the bed on CBS and been booted down to Showtime. When the fight happened on Showtime, I mean, all they really had for a follow-up was Fedor fighting and losing to other people, Bigfoot Silva. Um, so, you know, you only get these rare bites at the apples, and 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 if you miss it, it's a it's a could have been, a could have, should have, would have, I could have been a contender, and, and nobody else cares. So that's kind of where the UFC is with Ronda Rousey. We're going to maybe – I'll definitely do a sixth round tonight with the Ultimate Fighter finale. Frankly, the last thing I want to do tonight is watch uh, uh, more UFC. My family is sick of me spending my holiday weekend. Uh, it's not a holiday weekend for me, but, I mean, you know, it is for everybody else. And, and looking at this card, there's two fights on the card I care about, Frankie Edgar and BJ Penn, which is a senior league fight, essentially. BJ Penn's chance to go out on his shield, which could have made uh, UFC 175 really special. You know that could have really added to the card, uh, and you know, or you know, look at look at some of the fights we've had recently, like Cub Swanson and Jeremy Stevens. That could have added a, a ton to the card, uh, but it didn't. Uh, the only other fight I'm interested in is Flyweight's Justin Scoggins versus Dustin Ortiz, which is admittedly for hardcores only. Like nobody cares about the flyweight division except for the real freaks like me and St. Simon and Dallas Winston and Eugene S. Robinson and Connor Rubish and the rest of the gang. Anyway, but I will be back with the sixth round. I'm going to have to watch the card. And I'll, I'll, I'll be back to complain about it afterwards. Or maybe it'll be great. Maybe I'll be in a good mood and, and, and be happy, but whatever. And then after that, uh, we don't have anything again until the UFC Fight Night Cerrone versus Miller, which is coming up on July 16th. Then they're going to go to Dublin on July 19th uh, for Conor McGregor's return, uh, which I believe is going to be on Fight Pass. Um, I'm, I, I can't even tell if it's going to be on Fight Pass or FX1. And then uh, we'll have um, July 26th, Lawler versus Brown on Fight Night. That one actually looks pretty smoking. Uh, July 26th uh, in San Jose, uh, Robbie Lawler versus Matt Brown. And then uh, August 2nd, we may or may not have a pay-per-view uh, UFC 176. And then uh, Bader versus St. Pru on August 16th. Uh, Bisbee versus Kung Lee in Macau. That will be a Fight House event on August 23rd. 
and then August 23rd, another doubleheader. Ah, oh, we hate these uh, in Oklahoma with uh, 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 Ben Henderson is going to fight Rafael dos Anjos. Uh, I mean, just you know, and then UFC 177 comes back, and it's the bantamweight title fight between TJ Dillashaw and Hanan Burrell. That's the Sept That's the end of August pay per view. Two August pay per view. I mean, you know, hopefully they'll be able to move the rest of the UFC 176 card on Moss into that uh, card and stack it up because you know you got Jack Ray versus Musasi and some other fights on 176 that could be good. Uh, uh, you know, and then September 5th they're having a fight night. Uh, September 13th, they're having a, a fight night. That's going to be in Brazil. Uh, then the, uh, then they're having a Japanese card on September 20th. I mean, and then finally we get to John Gustafson on September 27th in Las Vegas. So it's just like, anyway, it's just a sea of, of, of probably mediocre to bad cards coming up. So, you know, hopefully Scott Coker will be doing something interesting in Bellator on and off. I don't expect anything from World Series of Fight. And I do want to comment on the Nick Newell fight. I think he's a, I think he's a for real fighter. But I also think there's this story element. And putting him in against Geisha for the title was probably a little premature. And it's just hard to watch a one-handed man taking a beating like that. And I think it kind of snuffs uh, Nick Newell's chances of being a breakout star and and uh, puts a real limit on his career. And I honestly think the UFC should have snapped him up. And, and if there is a freak show element to that, it was also a human interest story. The guy's not a freak show. He's a really talented athlete overcoming a disability. And I would like to have seen how far he could have gone uh, under the UFC banner instead of seeing him just take a beating on a NBC paid-for card nobody was watching. Just a waste Waste, waste, waste. Nick Newell mishandled by the MMA gods. Anyway, hey, we're all in the hands of an angry god, as Jonathan Edwards said, just who thinks of us as a hideous spider about to drop us into the abyss. So it is what it is, kids. We'll be back. This is Kid Nate. Remember to give us a like on this video. Uh, subscribe to, to us on MMANation.com on YouTube. That's YouTube.com slash M-M-A-N-A-T-I-O-N-D-O-T-C-O-M. Then you'll see all our videos. Follow me at Kid Nate on Twitter. Although I never tweet about MMA, you can also follow me on Facebook where I do talk about MMA more often. And read us on bloodyelbow.com, and I'll be back tonight, maybe with Zane Simon, maybe solo, maybe with Dallas Winston for the sixth round uh, 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 review of the tough finale. Uh, adios, MMA aficionados. Eugene S. Robinson will be back tomorrow with Knuckle Up, hopefully, unless he's – I'm sure he'll do a Knuckle Up for this card. And then uh, Eugene and, and uh, Dallas and I will do some kind of fun – uh, MMA three-way this week maybe or maybe Eugene and I'll do the intrigue episode we've been talking about. So, adios MMA aficionados, this is Kid Nate. Thanks for watching.